For the newcomers in the audience, uh, you are here at the invited section lecture 15.2 and 17.2. So section 15 of the IMU is for um, numerical analysis and scientific computing, and section 17 is for mathematics and science and technology applications. Um, we're here today to listen to our second speaker. It's Professor Chiang Du. He is the Fu Foundation Professor of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics at Columbia University in the USA. Prior to moving to Columbia, he was the Vern M. Willimon Professor of Mathematics at Penn State University, also in the USA. Professor Du's PhD is from Carnegie Mellon University, and his uh, advisor was Max Gutzenberg, Gutzberger. Research interests are in numerical analysis, mathematical modeling, and scientific computation with applications in physical, biological materials, data, and information sciences. So I'd like us all to welcome Chi Ang Du with his talk titled An Invitation to Non-Local Modeling, Analysis, and Computation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain, for the introduction. Uh, let me begin my lecture by thanking the uh, ICM, thanking the uh, program committee and the uh, various panels for inviting me to this, uh, this great conference. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, tell you some stories about uh, what we've been doing the last few years. Uh, I, I'm hoping my voice is loud enough so everyone can hear. Uh, so, so uh, this is a quick uh, all line. I, I will tell you a little bit about uh, what non-local models are about, uh, where, why we study them, what's the motivation, and maybe uh, some mathematics and also algorithm behind those models. Uh, if you're not familiar with non-local models, I, I, rather than giving you a formal definition, I'll use some examples to illustrate what are the uh, similarities and differences uh, with the traditional models. Uh, everyone uh, uh, knows about the differential equation. That's called a local model. Of course, this is a section also about numerical analysis. And if you are a numerical analyst and you have worked with different approximations to the differential equations. Uh, so the non-local models, what I'm going to introduce is a little bit more general than both of them. Uh, you can uh, think, for example, a, a non-local continuum or integral equations. Uh, this is associated with a non-local differential operator. And this operator, this integral non-local operator is nothing but just an average of the uh, center difference operators, right? So this is for a given kernel that's given on here. This is how you weight the, the different scales. And we're going to, uh, we're not going to take a finite difference, rather we're taking a continuum uh, average of this difference operator. And this range goes from, uh, say, uh, minus delta to delta. This, uh, this gives you a categorization of the range of non-local impact. Uh, so we say that this uh, model is more general uh, because uh, you can take this kernel, right? You can make that to be a direct delta measure, either at the origin or at some finite mesh size, where you can take a sequence of uh, uh, kernels approaching to those uh, singular measures. And then the non-local operator will converge or will be equivalent to the differential operator or the difference operator. So in, in that sense, it's much more general. And you can even also take a a, 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 a kernel that's of fractional type, and you make this uh, delta uh, go to infinity, uh, it could become a totally global operator. In this case, uh, this non-local operator uh, will give you a special fractional derivatives of your standard uh, uh, differential operator. Right. Uh, so it's indeed more general than many of those special cases, but I also want to say that uh, this non-local model can serve as uh, perhaps alternatives or tools or bridges to the existing models. And let me illustrate that through a few examples. Right? Uh, I begin the story with, say, the non-local model perhaps can serve as a bridge between different models. Uh, one example I'll give you is to say, uh, it may be it can be used to uh, bridge a local diffusion equation and maybe a globally defined fractional uh, diffusion equation models. So I'm going to introduce a non-local derivative. And this, again, this is this is almost like you take a backward difference and you average that over a particular uh, time scale. So this delta will measure the length of your memory. Right? Uh, so let's compare. On this side, I, I write down the standard uh, normal diffusion equation, the heat equation. 
Uh, on the other end, we write down the fractional security equation. This will be a fractional derivative of certain order. Okay. And uh, so this non-local, if you replace the uh, integer derivative by this uh, uh, local derivative by this non-local derivative, we'll end up with a non-local in time uh, diffusion type dynamics. And we say that this perhaps can bridge the two. Uh, this is not just a mathematical uh, uh, toy or invention. It's motivated by recent uh, uh, studies, uh, particularly recent uh, experimental studies that reported uh, some very interesting behavior, sort of anomalous diffusion behavior in biological systems. And you have uh, uh, proteins um, diffusing a membrane uh, system where they start out to be uh, sub-diffusive and then later on becomes normal diffusive. Uh, the plows are, by the way, the mean square distance with respect to time. So we know for standard normal diffusion, it would just be a straight line with a slope, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a linear slope. Uh, but you see this uh, sub-diffusion behavior and later on going to the normal diffusion. This is not a more recent one, uh, nature communication. Those actually are done by my uh, former colleagues at Hong Kong USD, where I used to work. So in comparing to those experiments, we actually did a numerical simulation. This is done by uh, my postdoc, uh, Zhou, and also another postdoc, Jiang Yang, who was a former student of Professor Tang Tao here. Uh, so if you, if you solve numerically this non-local in time dynamics, because of this finite memory span, what happens is that in initial time, memory plays a very important role. Right? So memory is so important that, that the diffusion behaves essentially like sub-diffusive. It's non covid but later on, as time goes by, if you only have finite memory compared to the whole time history, the memory effect diminishes. So therefore, you're almost like memory less. So you're getting into the Markovian regime and that goes to the, uh, Markov uh, goes to the normal diffusion. Right? So this will be a single model, a very effective model that captures this, uh, this perhaps this crossover. Uh, my, my Four key doesn't doesn't work now. Maybe just my hand is speaking. All right, thank you. So this non-local in time dynamics captures this crossover from the sub-diffusive uh, regime to the normal diffusion regime uh, very effectively. Right? So this is one example where we we can use this non-local models to bridge. A, a local model and a fraction model. Now, let me get to the second example, uh, again, uh, motivated by an uh, example, uh, by, a mot uh, by uh, application. So I want to talk about that the non-local uh, models can be used as tools to understand existing local models like PDs. Right? So one of the examples I pick here is uh, the so-called the numerical methods, uh, the so-called smooth particle hydrodynamics, or HPH for short. And this is a uh, 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 the pioneers in this uh, subject, uh, Jingo, Monaghan, and Lucy, in about 40 years ago. It's a quite popular numerical methods in computational fluid dynamics. It, it got over 5,000 citations. And the key idea of HPH is based on uh, some non-local or integral relaxations or smoothings of your local quantum mechanics. Okay. Uh, I'll sh explain, uh, without going into the detail, I'll explain roughly the euro sort of the two steps for, for constructing an HPH discretization schemes. Right. So we're, we're using a, a, a kernel, a smooth kernel, okay, uh, depending on the uh, spatial location, and also a smoothing length delta. This is, this is like uh, measures the support of this kernel, but also it's going to measure the range of non-local regularization you're going to use. So with this kernel, with this smoothing kernel uh, like this, what you're going to do is whenever you want to do time uh, derivative, uh, you want to do spatial derivatives of the function, instead of differentiating directly on u, you could use this integral representation to differentiate instead on the kernel itself. All right? And so this is called a non-local smoothing, okay, this first step. And, and you can think about this really, uh, this is replacing a local derivative by a non-local integral operator. And this has nothing to do with this validation. This is completely, they can be completely done on the computer level. To turn that into a discrete model, you can introduce a quadrature this validation uh, using particle like quadrature integrations, and that gives you a discrete summation rules, and this becomes uh, something you can implement on the computer. Right. So that step is called a uh, uh, particle quadrature approximation. Of course, this gives you another parameter which measures the, uh, the sort of spacing or distribution of your particles. And so it's the key that uh, we're not going to 
uh, discretize the derivative directly, but rather we're going to do that indirectly by considering this non-local regularization to your local PDE first. There are many ideas like this. You can do non-localizations to, uh, for example, hybotic conservation laws, which was subject discussed in the, in the, in the uh, earlier, earlier uh, lecture, right? Uh, but anyway, so the message is that uh, if you develop a better non-local coming model, and this can perhaps help you to design even better numerical visualizations, even though your goal is to solve local PDEs, but you may end up with better visualization schemes for local PDEs. And we have a, uh, a joint work with uh, Stephen Chapman and Tian uh, recently. So this will be a second example of possible uh, applications. And uh, uh, one more thing I want to talk about non-local model, the role of non-local model in, in, in mathematical modeling is that perhaps they can also be alternatives to some traditional quantum mechanics, including, for example, conservation laws. And conservation laws were always derived, PDEs are derived with smooth function in mind, right? So whenever you run to shops, you have to reinterpret what's the meaning of the particular equation. You have to introduce notions like, you know, weight solutions, viscosity solutions, and so forth. Uh, so those forms of local PDEs are introduced uh, in the old days uh, as, a, as a common way of expression and the fundamental physics. Uh, but perhaps they will become much more questionable if you're interested in, say, material defects, or like if, if you have a material that has cracks in there, you have a discontinued deformation field, then your elasticity equation may not hold near cracks. So you have to modify that. Right. So one example of uh, using a uh, non-local model as alternative to those PDEs is given by this uh, so-called peridynamics. This is a model introduced by uh, Sor Shilling and SND National Lab uh, not too long ago. Uh, basically, it's to try to rewrite quantum mechanics using a non-local integral model that, that replaces the spatial derivatives in the classical Newton's equation, Newton's law, right, uh, by a non-local integral operator. You know, I just simply write in this particular way, this is called state-based formulation of peridynamics. Um, again, the model has been used quite successfully to do lots of uh, large-scale numerical simulations of, of crack propagation, and also uh, uh, fractures of, of uh, a projectile hitting at targets, right? So, so those, you can see that a piece uh, get into many, many fragments. And we also try to do simulations. This is the simulation done by my student uh, in Jutau in Columbia, right? uh, showing you the propagation of a, a crack pass and also the bifurcation. Um, so if you use this uh, non-local paradigms uh, properly, and you can uh, treat discontinuity displacement on the fly, you don't have to introduce actual equations for this motion of displacement of material points. And this will make it more effective to model or to predict material failure. So this is the third point. This is to say non-local models can also serve perhaps as alternative to replace your local PDs. Um, and so in a, in a way, we think about non-local models as uh, effective descriptions uh, whenever you see some anonymous processes or singular behaviors, they can be more effective than local models. And there's a great potential uh, to, to, to develop them. And these are alternatives, tools, or bridges to local PDEs and, and other uh, discrete models as well. Um, I also want to make a point that uh, in, a, in the days of multi-scale modeling, uh, uh, non-locality is actually a generic outcome of doing model reductions or coarse screening. Even the simple, a simple example of reducing a, a, a three-dimensional PDE to a two-dimensional boundary integral equation, and you see that boundary integral equation becomes non-local. So non-locality happens uh, uh, very generically. Of course, there were discussions uh, historically uh, by many you know, well-known mathematicians, physicists in the work of Reilly, Van der Waals, and Portlake. I will not uh, elaborate too, too much on that. So uh, in a world we live in, uh, we see that as uh, the world we perceive gets smaller and smaller, we see it's more connected and that, 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 that connectedness and, and that with uh, our, our uh, increasing appetite to study more complex systems and to address singularities and anomalies, I think this, this, this uh, is going to fuel the growth of non-local modeling. Um, the, uh, there is a particular uh, topic that I want to uh, discuss more today, which is related to the work we've been doing. It's a focus on the study of systems for vector and tensor fields uh, and non-local model is a finite range of non-local interactions characterized by high rhythm parameter delta. Right? And, and this is driven by application to mechanics. So whether you do fluid mechanics or, or uh, solid mechanics, you have to deal with 
vector fields, right? So that's very natural to deal with system equations. Uh, and also even to geometry of data. Uh, uh, on that hand, if you have a system equations, this offers much richer mathematical structure to, uh, to study than a simple scalar equation. Okay. Uh, I should mention that, you know, there were lots of uh, uh, non-local models involving scalar non-local operators in the work of uh, uh, Osher, Caffarelli, and many others, right? Um, and furthermore, it, it motivates us to have a more systematic uh, uh, development of a, uh, of a mathematical framework to, to understand uh, non-local models just like we've been used to uh, using a, a framework for solving PDs. Right? And we call that as non-local vector calculus and non-local calculus variation. Uh, I'll begin the illustration of the mathematics with a simple uh, linear paradigm model uh, for, for uh, sprint systems. So think of what we're going to do linear elasticity. Uh, we have a material, elastic material, and I'm going to write down the force balance equation. So at a material point x, I imagine that within a neighborhood of delta, and any material point will, it will interact with x through a linear spring force. And that spring force uh, typically is going to be a, 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 a along the bound direction. It's a linear force, so we do the hooking spring. It's along this linear direction, uh, along this bound direction, and its magnitude is proportional to the relative displacement along the spinal direction. So we do a projected relative displacement. Uh, and this, this serves as a hooking uh, spring constant. So then we simply sum up all the possible spring, uh, spring forces together within this uh, uh, neighborhood of, uh, of, of delta range. Right? And this, this is properly weighted. Uh, this gives us the force balance. So this is the internal spring force, the total spring force has to balance with an external force. Of course, when the material points get to the boundary, uh, I need to, I need to comp complement that with uh, 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 possibly maybe the conditions of the displacement uh, in the outside layer. And one simple way is uh, for simplicity, we just set that displacement to zero. So we, we, we uh, uh, stick them together, don't let them move. Right? And this serves as an analog to the local uh, boundary conditions for PDEs. Right? Uh, you look at this, of course, you, you wonder, uh, does this really look like linear elasticity? Right? Uh, for elasticity equations can be written down very elegantly, but here we have a complicated integral formulation. Right? Well, I'll start with a one-dimensional uh, simple case, just to draw your attention. Uh, if you specialize all those things without the vector notation in a one-dimensional case, and you end up with uh, using the symmetry of this kernel function, you end up with uh, the second difference operator we see again in my very first slides, and average over this kernel, and then equal to the uh, uh, external force. And of course, if you make delta goes to zero in the local limit, you recover the second order equation, so that's not too far from a linear elastic one. Right. Okay, um, now to, to go into further mathematics, I think this is, uh, this is a good time for me to jump from sort of this motivation to multiplication modeling into a little bit of mathematical theory and analysis uh, of the non local models. So what do we did first? So in an attempt to rewrite this, uh, this uh, non local integral equation as something much more elegant that we used to, 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 to do with uh, differential operators, we're going to introduce some non local operators, right? Uh, so this non local operator here is like a divided difference. And it actually has physical meaning. I will not elaborate too much. And we also define its dual operators in a standard duality uh, way. A and once you have them, actually you can compose those operators together and they give you, uh, sur now surprisingly, that they give you exactly this uh, integral operator that we have defined earlier. So that, that's really this uh, linear elasticity operator we start always. Uh, so it's those operators and together with some other uh, basic non-local operators, for example, we have also introduced uh, what's called non-local gradient, and also what's a non-local derivative, uh, what's a non-local divergence, right? For some uh, uh, vector kernels, right? So it's a scalar kernel times a unit vector, and with properly average differences. Okay? Um, uh, and, and those operators together, plus the relationship between them, the integral identities, they form the core of the so-called non-local vector calculus. And this is something we start always, uh, Ginsburger, Lefouk, and, and another student, Joe, a few years earlier, and then also with uh, Dr. Mingisa, one of my former postdoc, we did a much more rigorous analysis uh, based on this framework. Uh, I don't have time to go through the details of this uh, uh, whole framework, but let me just give you a, a flavor of what this framework uh, intends to do. Right? 
So at least on this side, uh, the features of what we learned uh, in, in, in college, uh, in high school, the local calculus, and here will be what we try to uh, develop as a non-local calculus, right? The essence is that we're going to replace the PDEs by non-local balance laws, and so your differential equation now is replaced by, by a non-local integral equation, except those operators are now the non-local gradient, non-local divergence instead of local one. Uh, everyone does PDEs, knows that it's important to understand how to do integration of the parts, or you know, your Green's identity, your divergence theorem, so forth like that. And we have the analog of non-local integration by parts. So it's actually very, uh, 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 very interesting. It's, it's more like a Fermi theorem. It's more like an order of change of integration. That serves like an integrated part for the local PDE case. Right? And again, this whole framework was motivated by, uh, by uh, both application from mechanics, uh, shading and paradynamics, and also the work on you know, uh, analysis of data and images, and some earlier mathematical work on analyzing uh, superlative spaces from a non-local perspective. Uh, uh, by Bogen, Brzezis, Mulesko, and Panse, and so forth. Of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, mathematical studies on fractional PDEs by Kaflade and his school. Uh, based on this vector compass, and we can uh, go uh, further to try to give a precise or more rigorous characterization of different non-local function spaces, functionals, and operators, uh, as well as their different, uh, lo uh, different lo limits, like the local limits when delta goes to zero, where the fractal limit when delta goes to infinity. And of course, we can consider applying those kind of uh, uh, analytical settings to study non-local variational problems as well as non-local uh, evolution equations. So in, in a nutshell, uh, we, we put some effort to try to systematically or, or maybe even asymmetrically develop this whole uh, uh, non-local framework for non-local models. And again, this is drawn by applications to uh, mechanics. Uh, I'll show you an example uh, for, for a particular non-local conversion problem that relates to this linear bound-based dynamics model I introduced earlier. I'll give you some assumptions on the kernel, uh, or normalization condition, and this condition really to say that when delta goes to zero, it behaves more like a, a delta measure, and, and so therefore things will get localized. Uh, so the linear bound-based dynamics, actually in the local limit, indeed will recover a uh, linear elasticity model. And for the non-local model, we're going to work with a non-local space, which is much, uh, uh, generally can be much larger. Right? So this, this non-local function space saturates between a, a local space, which in this case will be your standard H1 solid space. Right? Uh, but it's, this is in between the H1 and L2. It can be as large as functions in L2, because we're trying to capture perhaps singular deformations or deformations that could be continuous across the co-dimensional one interface. So, so having a relaxed regularity is good for us. And of course, the natural space is, uh, is defined as functions which have this, uh, this bounded energy norm. Right? So this will be a weighted difference norm. Uh, in comparison, this will be a local limit. Okay? It actually gives you a particular case of uh, a very equation of linear elasticity with a particular Poisson ratio, depending on the space dimension. Uh, so mathematically, we'll have a a, a non-local version of problem with a non-local boundary condition, uh, which as delta goes to zero, is connected with a local limit, a local elasticity equation with a local boundary condition. So those uh, non-local problems will pose with a unique, so, uh, with a unique solution, just like uh, you expect for the local one. Okay. And the solution themselves, although they were less regular for this non-local solution, but in the limit, they will converge to a, lim uh, to a local uh, solution, which is more regular which will have square integral derivatives. This convergence is in the sense of L2 because we don't expect much more regularity in that not function space. The key of doing that is to, of course, to derive this uh, non-local quorum ponderary type of inequality, just like the analysis you need for local PDEs. You have to translate that into this non-local world. And we did that by extending some earlier works. Those actually works uh, beautifully for scalar equations. And now we just need to uh, work out for the vector tensor case and involving non-local and that's highly technical, but uh, it can be done. Um, so um, the mathematics of non-local uh, models, hopefully I've provided a little bit of flavor of that for you. Uh, it's going to provide insight and guidance, right, not only for the, for the mathematical model development, but also uh, guidance for designing robust algorithms for numerical simulations. The kind of results we have uh, able to, uh, to uh, uh, obtain so far, including analysis of both 
uh, linear paradigm models of different kinds and nonlinear models and as well as uh, uh, time evolution equations. Uh, but what I'm really uh, happy to see is that the mathematical theory allowed us to find remedies to address some of the uh, popular but controversial practices, I issues, uh, uh, controversial issues in popular practices, including, for example, uh, stability of the so-called uh, paradigm correspondence modeling, and also uh, issues with approximations to uh, its pH and Laplacian. Uh, but I will use an example uh, where there, there were reports about incompatible numerical simulations of paradynamics with the local elasticity. I'll use this as an illustration of uh, how this mathematical theory is really going to provide you some insight. Uh, and this will be a good point for me to jump again from a mathematical theory analysis, get into the numerical aspect. Uh, to simulate paradynamics as a non-local model, a non-local model with a horizon parameter with a finite range, you can develop various kinds of numerical discretizations, particle masses, conforming, non-conforming finite element, uh, uh, many other adaptive fast algorithms and so forth. But I will focus instead on this issue of uh, designing robust algorithms, right? Because there has been quite a bit of uh, public code development effort going on, right? You want to develop code, put on the uh, internet, and somebody else will download and use it. If your code is not robust, and this can, cannot be satisfactory to the, to the users who want to use them, right? Uh, if you think about uh, simulating a pattern of such complexity, and uh, you must make sure that this can somehow be verified or validated. And of course, be able to, to validate this require you to have a good algorithm in the first place. And however, one thing, uh, one thing that has been reported is that uh, despite the fact that we have proven consistency between this non-local linear paradynamics and the linear elasticity, right, uh, on the common level, however, if you have two different codes, you try to compare the numerical results from the different codes, they will claim to say that the numerical results are not consistent. Right? That's somehow uh, puzzling. Right? And of course, we think that this is due to the uh, lack of robustness in some of the computation algorithms designed to solve this non-local model. And I'll show you some examples. Right? Um, again, I, I, I mentioned this robust algorithm is very important to do pretty uh, simulations of those complicated fractal patterns. So one of the notions we try to develop, this is with Xiao Chuan Tian, who's sitting in an audience, uh, in a few joint papers, and also in her PhD thesis, which by the way, uh, won her the best thesis uh, prize for the uh, Association of Women Mathematicians. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, so we developed a notion of advanced compatible digitalizing schemes. This means to find robust algorithm for paradynamics they will be robust with respect to the changing parameters, whether it's this uh, 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 non-local range parameter, horizon parameter delta, or the mesh spacing. Right? So robustness is the key. And we call this as only compatible, but this is really uh, in the similar spirit as other schemes like uh, isotopic preserving schemes uh, developed by Jin Shi uh, and many others, or locking free schemes for doing elasticity and so forth. There are a lot of similarities. But I'll try to uh, highlight uh, uh, what distinguishes our work from the earlier works. So here we have a, a solution of a non-local continuum model, uh, basically parameterized by this uh, non-local horizon delta, right? So if delta is positive, it's a non-local model. As delta goes to zero, and this in the simple linear case, we have consistency to the PDEs. If we're designing numerical schemes for solving this non-local model, and we make sure that when we refine the mesh, it's going to solve our non-local model for us. And that's good. But we also like to see that if we have this uh, horizon parameter gets smaller and smaller, we hope that this numerical solution, which is designed to solve non-local model uh, in the local limit, will also recover the solution of the local limit. That would be called as not a bubble. If you use mathematical terms, you like to say, well, this diagram will be commutative. It doesn't matter which path you take, it's going to end up with the same limit. Right? That would be desirable. But surprisingly, not all the numerical schemes for non-local models are isomorphically compatible. In fact, some of the most popular ones are not. Right? Uh, well, if you, if you think about uh, paradynamics as the integral equation, you discretize that by what? By doing a say, simplest one with Riemann sum. But turns out the uh, simple particle discretization with Riemann sum quadrature is not isomorphically compatible. If you want to do finite element, you think about doing a very general uh, setting. Uh, because you're working with possibly L2 function space, uh, functions could be discontinuous. 
then nothing is simpler than using piecewise linear phenomenon. But turns out, uh, phenomenon is piecewise, sorry, piecewise constant phenomenon, right? And that's not going to be as not comfortable either. Uh, uh, so Xiao Tran one day did some numerical experiments. So she kept the ratio delta over H unchanged while refining the grid. So you're refining the mesh and you're letting delta go to zero simultaneously. Uh, so this is one of the uh, numerical results for a particular uh, mesh size. Then she refined the mesh, well, the numerical solution, now falls on top of each other. If you think about numerical convergence, you say, oh, perfect, this already started to converge. Wonderful. Indeed, the approximation converges. But unfortunately, it's converging to a wrong local limit. The real local limit on a communal level for the right uh, physical parameter is this one right here. So they are far from the actual solution you're trying to simulate. And one of the reasons is that the numerical schemes are overestimating your elastic constant by constant factor. This constant factor will never change as you refine your grid. So the error will always be there. Now, you can actually uh, uh, explain this very easily. Uh, I use a simple uh, one-dimensional model as an example. We take a particular kernel to make sure that the synodical operator will just look like an average of the second difference, not the divided difference, but the, just the difference with synodical bounded conditions. You take a simplest possible Riemann sum to discretize this guy. Right? And it's easy to show that this will be a convergent discretization uh, whenever you make h smaller and smaller, but for given delta. Right? So this will be a convergent discretization. But if you keep the ratio, which is the delta over h unchanged, and you make delta and h go to zero simultaneously, easily you can figure out that uh, it's going to converge to a local equation, but with a modified uh, coefficient. It's no longer one. And that depends on what's ratio of delta over uh, what's the ratio of delta over h, or how many uh, are nodes within this non-local range of interaction. Of course, when r goes to infinity, this converges to one. Okay. But for fixed r, this error will always be there; will never go. It turns out you have a very simple remedy to to uh, to overcome this. You just need to change the weight somewhat. Don't use that constant. You make that change to be something else. You have trouble with microphone? No. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this con construction actually can also be uh, extended to higher dimensional case. Um, I will not go into uh, the details. Uh, but for non-local systems, uh, a, 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 which different from the scalar case, the scalar case you can have a lot of tools like maximum principle, things like that to use. But here for the non-local system, we don't have maximum principle. So instead, we'll work with uh, finite element, a uh, type of uh, conforming lurking methods instead. This can be much more general. They can work with systems, working in any dimension, and work with uh, unstructured mesh, for example. Uh, this framework actually is based on a much more general uh, setup for parameterized variational problems. So typically, you have a, 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 a variational problem involving a parameter sigma, and sigma we have some limit. This one has a discretization, and you wonder what happens when both the uh, model parameter goes to a limit, and also when your discretization parameter goes to a limit, right? So the setup is quite technical. Uh, I do not want to delve into uh, the details, but if you have, uh, you just think about you have a uh, set of parameterized, uh, in this case, linear version problems, and you're going to introduce a set of uh, uh, finite dimensional subspaces of your function space, so you can create a uh, uh, standard glurking approximations that give you the finite system equations. And in the particular case, in the non-local systems, you can think about this delta as one over sigma. So sigma goes to infinity, delta goes to zero. That's just a chain of rotation. Right? And, and you have all the different function spaces to, uh, to work with. Okay. Um, so to show that the numerical simulations, we get the this, this solution, uh, uh, will, this depend on sigma, will converge to the non-local solution, and also possibly will converge to the local solution in the local limit. We need a set of assumptions. Uh, the assumptions are quite technical and quite long. Don't, please don't read it. But I, let me just uh, explain that. We need some assumptions on function spaces. We need some assumptions on the bilinear forms, which, design, which uh, defines your, uh, uh, your version of problems. We also need assumptions on operators. Right? And, and in this uh, uh, complicated list of uh, conditions, really, uh, the couple of things are key. One of the key is that we need a so-called asymptotic compact embedding property. And this will say, if you're solving a sequence of uh, parameterized problems, 
if those sequence of solutions in their respective norms, in their respective function spaces, if they somehow remain uniformly bounded, then you will be able to find a convergent subsequence. So that's a relative compactness argument. Right? And of course, the limit point, you don't, uh, 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 the limit point, you, you hope that they will live in a better space or they actually live in a limit space, they will be eventually uh, try to be the solution of your local problem, of your limiting problem. Uh, 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 regarding this bilinear form, the key thing is to show that your bilinear form is going to be coercive, and in fact, you have a constant that's independent of the parameter. So you have uniform coercivity. Again, this will be based on the, the work we've done, this kind of non-local quorum punctuation inequality. That's the key. Uh, well, uh, uh, more than those function space and the operators, you also need conditions about the approximation theory. A, so standard best approximation theory for any version of problems, but you need something extra because of the parameterized, uh, parameterized uh, problem nature. Uh, so what we need now is we need this family of parameterized function spaces, this discrete spaces, right? They need not only to be dense in the respective non-local space, but they need to be asymptotically dense in the limiting space. Okay? That's the key. And so what it means is that if you're interested in uh, finding solutions of the local problem, in this limiting space, right? Uh, so if you have an element in that space, you better make sure you can find a sequence of functions in those discretization spaces, which as your parameter goes to a limit, as you refine your mesh, and they can provide you good approximations in a, uh, a sort of limiting function space. That's really the key. That again is an asymptotic property. And with all those uh, properties in place, you can have a, a very nice theorem established that this, this diagram really essentially becomes commutative, right? And you can also further to say, uh, if your finite dimension spaces are somehow uh, the, the common intersections of your non-local discrete spaces uh, intersect with your limiting space, will give you a precise uh, discrete space of this local limit, then you can also get the consistency of the numerical schemes. So when you do the numerical simulation, you can set your parameter sigma equals zero, and that will become a numerical method for solving the limiting problem. All right. Okay, uh, so uh, specialized, uh, the framework we established was really for a more general parameterized version of problems. Uh, for non-local problems like paradynamics, you need to verify the list of conditions we have, uh, we have uh, given uh, earlier. Uh, that's technical, but it can be done. So essentially, it boils down to the following result. Uh, almost all the, non uh, all the conforming lurking uh, approximations for those non-local paradigm models will be as not compatible. Right? If they satisfy the condition that they can contain all the continuous piecewise linear elements. So uh, the, the piecewise linear continuous element is the basic function space to approximate, say, your second over PD. Right? So you ensure that, if you ensure you can have that space in, uh, included, then you can capture your local solution, which is very reasonable. But in comparison, your piecewise constant function space doesn't contain this one, so therefore it cannot serve as a asymptotic compatible scheme. It, it does converge, but you need some extra conditions. Uh, I will not discuss in more detail. So to summarize, uh, the theory is applicable to very general systems in any dimension, and uniform and structure mesh, whether you do strong or weak forms, it, it, it can also be applicable. Uh, and, and this method allows us to design a much more robust numerical schemes where, where you know, for the standard model, whether you have uh, a small delta, large delta, it doesn't matter. It's always going to give you the right solution for the corresponding to the right physical model or, or the right uh, uh, counting model. Right? And this is already showing some practical impact of this more uh, mathematical development. Um, so people, you know, like Sandia National Lab, they're they trying to uh, uh, use this kind of notions to change their, their uh, numeric codes for doing the fracture mechanics. Um, so we've been discussing about algorithm and numerical simulations, but I think uh, uh, when you do, after you have done your numeric experiments, this maybe can also further motivate you to more uh, questions about modeling and analysis. So I'll try to wrap up my lecture with a final segment to talk about uh, new modeling issues and analysis issues. Right. Um, I've advocated the fact that non-local models allow you to have uh, singular solutions uh, because you can retain more physics in your model and maybe you can work with uh, uh, non-local, uh, by, by working with non-local interactions, but they're more complicated, right? Computationally, it could be more costly. 
So one way of reducing that complexity of that computational cost is perhaps to couple that with local models, especially in regions where you don't expect singularities. And this is the idea, for example, of multi-scale modeling. Right? And so coupling with local models perhaps can make the whole simulation more effective. The question is, how do we do the coupling? Well, there are many coupling strategies has been decided uh, quite, quite recently in the last few years, including energy-based uh, blending, uh, coupling by optimization, quasi-non-local modeling, uh, and also heterogeneous lo localization. I will simply pick this last one in the last few minutes or so to illustrate uh, how do we do this uh, local and non-local coupling. Okay. Um, so imagine that I have a physical domain where I'm going to do this uh, simulation. Okay. But over this region, uh, I expect maybe there's some singular effect, and so therefore my non-local model is supposed to be more effective or valid in those regions. Uh, but a priori, let me assume that I know uh, the singularity will not happen over here. Right. And that's a big assumption. And of course, it's very important for me uh, to identify, you know, where are the regions where you expect singularity, where are the regions you don't. But let's put that uh, question asi aside. Just to say hypothetically, I, I do know that those are the troublesome regions, those are uh, not. So uh, perhaps we can think about having a local PD model on the side and a non-local model on, on the other side. And for illustration purposes, I will use a simple scalar second-order PD as an example. And this will be a non-local diffusion equation, which is an analog of that. Right. Uh, the solution over here can be quite uh, uh, singular, much less regular. They can just be L2 functions. And here we have functions which are more regular. Of course, then, for those functions which are less regular, you don't expect to be able to match exactly on this interface with the solutions coming from the PD side. Okay. So in order to do that matching, uh, what we try to, what, uh, one of the techniques we uh, introduce is to do this heterogeneous localization. This is, again, joined with Xiao Chuan. Um, the whole idea is that we have a non-local range of interaction, which will be finite in this non-local region. And that's how we can uh, allow singular solutions to exist. But as the material points move closer and closer to the interface, where on the side we don't expect singularities, we're going to shrink our horizon. We're actually we're going to make this horizon go to zero uh, at this interface. So that will make everything localized. But it's a heterogeneous localization because over this side, the uh, non-local interaction is still uh, uh, dominating. It's only going to be diminishing near interface. Right. So it's in this way we're going to couple a PD and a non-local model together. All right. And you can write down a variational formulation. So on this local model, you have your standard uh, local energy, maybe uh, say elastic energy. On this uh, non-local region, we'll have this uh, integral formulation of a non-local interaction energy. Right. And we have the total energy added together, and this will be worked down by the external force. Of course, the question is, how do we couple the solution from the left and with the solution on the right. Well, the solution from the left has a well-defined trace in a fractal space, but the solution on the right, if, if you have a constant horizon, it's not to give you the right regularity. It does not necessarily define the right trace for you. So one of the critical results that, that uh, uh, Shoshan proved is, is the following uh, non-local trace theorem, which is a result that in some ways, strengthen the classical tree theorem. Right? The classical tree theorem for second order PDE says that if you're functioning in the H1 space, then it has a well defined H1 half trace on the co dimensional one interface, on the boundary. Right? But what we have now, the new result says that uh, this H1 half trace can be bounded by this non local edge norm, which is more or less characterized by this uh, 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 double integral over here. But what's essential is that. Uh, you can have kernels that this kernel perhaps can kill the regular, uh, can kill the singularity when x and y collides. But however, the horizon itself is going to get more and more localized near the boundary, and this localization provides the extra control of the regulated solutions so that you can have this norm uh, be upper bound of your h1 half tr uh, trace on the boundary. A and this non-local norm is always bounded by your uh, by your standard solar space norm whenever your space, whenever your function is in this smaller space. Right. So in this case that we do have a, a generalization of the classical result and it's a stronger result than the, uh, than the uh, classical result. In fact, you can say that it's perhaps uh, more natural because uh, if we need regularity on the boundary, 
Why do we need regularity away from that? We just need regularity right on the boundary. And that's what this nautical space, what this nautical norm does for you exactly. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Kafrali uh, had a follow-up question to say, uh, of course, we have this trace theorem for this particular nautical space we introduced, but his question is whether you can find sort of the largest function space that's going to provide you this kind of trace inequality. Of course, we don't know the answer for that. That's still an open question. Uh, the implication of this uh, heterogeneous localization allows you to define, uh, uh, for even for non-local version of problems, a local geometry type of boundary boundary problems. You don't need necessarily a non-local boundary condition to define this version of problem. Of course, you can use that to have now a well-defined couple local and non-local model. Right? Uh, and, and just to uh, sort of as a, as a uh, wrap up a for loop, uh, the asymptotic compatible schemes, remember I talked about, they are robust respect to change of the uh, horizon parameters. So even if you do a heterogeneous localization where somewhere delta is large, somewhere delta tends to zero, it does not matter. The asymptotic compatible numerical schemes will still converge to the right physical solutions. And so with that together, it's like we complete the full loop of going from non-local modeling and to applications, paradynamics, and mathematical analysis of you know, trace theorem, variational problems, and also numerical schemes, right? So uh, I have about a minute left. I, 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 I uh, I'll just point out to you there are other works on, say, for example, non-local facial models, non-local conservation models, and also non-local Stokes equations, uh, 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 various features, but I won't have time to go into that. The, the title of my lecture is an uh, invitation to non-local modeling. So, the talk will not be complete if I don't give you some uh, uh, open questions. Of course, I think there are a lot of questions to be asked. Uh, most fundamentally is perhaps on a model level, a rigorous derivation of non-local models for multi-scale, multi-physics problems uh, from, you know, maybe uh, microscopic physics. And also couple that with uh, inverse problems or, or experimental data to do this uh, uh, inverse problem to figure out what the right model should be, what's the right non-local interaction model, the non-local horizon parameter, and so forth. In terms of fundamental uh, uh, mathematics, I describe non-local vector calculus, but you know, uh, the modern version of calculus is really done by exterior calculus. You need to do with non-local forms, and of course, there's a lot of uh, open questions over that. And also connection with stochastic processes, uh, uh, there are interesting connections. Lots of analytical questions dealing with uh, both variational problems and, and also dynamic systems. Okay. And of course, uh, on the numerical sides, more robust uh, adaptive numerical schemes, uh, uh, parallel methods, uh, domain decomposition methods, uh, and so forth. And of course, very importantly, on the, on the, on the application side, uh, uh, going from mechanics and to some data analysis and, and, and even artificial intelligence and so forth. So with that, uh, my time uh, just runs out. I will skip this, uh, this final conclusion, but very importantly, I'd like to acknowledge that this is joint work with uh, many of my collaborators. Uh, in particular, I, I uh, mentioned Xiao Tian Tian, who's sitting uh, right in, in front. She's now doing a uh, dean instructor at UT Austin. My former postdoc, Adeli Megisa, many of the work is done with him. Uh, Max Ginsburg and Richard Lehook introduced me to this subject of non-local modeling. And those are my uh, postdocs and students, former students, and different places. And there's also a long list of collaborators from other national labs and universities. I thank them all. Without them, the work wouldn't be possible. And also, I want to thank the support from uh, various uh, uh, funding agencies. Um, thank you very much. Xie Xie, how we go? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Um, well, several questions. I start sure. with one. Right. Uh, when I consider your, your heterogeneous model, uh, are you able to recover at the, the interface uh, the uh, classical interface conditions, at least in the case of the Laplacian, namely continuity of the solution and the continuity of the normal flux? Okay. Uh, sorry, Afio. Can you repeat your question again? If you in the, your heterogeneous model, when you take the coupling between the local and the non-local. Right, couple model, it, yes. Yeah, the couple model, if in the limit you can actually recover the continuity of the classical quantities such as U and the normal flux. The answer is yes. Your question is whether for the coupled local and non-local model, 
when everything gets completely localized, whether we cover the classical model? The answer is yes. yes. Maybe you have a second question, if you can. Hello. I am Amir Pani from IIT Bombay. Uh, my question is, if you have a Neumann boundary condition, you have done some extension from omega to omega tilde, the, the delta neighborhood of, sorry, omega delta, the delta neighborhood of omega. So how does one do that? Yeah, that, that's a good <coughs> question. Your question is, how do we do like, uh, you know, variational boundary condition, like Neumann boundary condition? That's a, that's a very nice question. Unfortunately, my time is limited. I didn't have time to go into that. Uh, you, can, you can develop a variational framework just like your PDE case. You, you can think about uh, you know, Neumann conditions as a natural variational conditions. And once you set up your energy, then whatever comes out will serve as a non-local Neumann condition. In a local limit, we'll recover a Neumann condition for local PDEs. It, it, it has been done, and I'll be very happy to share some references for you. OK, thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, my, my question is whether or not you are always consider the case of H over delta bounded, and if this is not the case, uh, which is the typical form of stability condition that you have in terms of H and delta? Uh, so uh, that's a good question. So the, the question is whether you know the ratio delta over H or H over delta, whether we make it small or large. So for asymptotic compatible schemes we really have no limitations on the ratio. The ratio can be very, very small, can go to zero, can also go to infinity. Uh, Xiaoshan has done some nice numerical simulations where uh, sometimes she took uh, h equal to delta square, and sometimes she took h equal to square root of delta. So if you think about uh, h equal to square root of delta, then within the delta range, your actual mesh points is farther away. But, but because of this uh, connections with the versional uh, numerical simulations, you still can recover the local limit correctly. So, so it's actually much more robust because most of the, say for example, SPH or other particle masses basically require you to have more and more particles within this non-local range interaction so that you can get a consistent local limit. But if you do this AC schemes, you don't need that requirement anymore. And we think that has a lot of future and hopefully we'll see more applications of that. But the key is you have to understand what your continuum non-local model is, then you can design better numerical schemes. Any other questions or comments? Let's thank Professor Ju once again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>